right. Woo. All right, that feels good. Hi, everybody. Advertising week is back, huh? Yeah, what a time to be here. The industry is booming, right? Of course, we're also drawing criticism from nearly every corner of society. But it's growing. Look at the growth. I mean, not the jobs. Those aren't growing. But the revenue, right? The advertising industry is growing. Feels good, huh? Huh. Actually, it's not really a great time to be in advertising. Hmm. So who the hell is this guy? Standing up here at Advertising Week and raining on the parade. Uh, my name is Paul Dyer. I'm the CEO at Lippy Taylor. Lippy Taylor is a 200 person earned marketing agency that doubled in size during the pandemic, largely because of the market forces I'm going to describe here today. I also wrote a book uh, this past summer. It was named a number two best selling business book by the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's called Friction Fatigue. And today I'm going to be sharing a lot of insights from the book over the course of the next 23 and a half minutes. Um, and it's going to be broken down into basically three main sections. The first, I'm going to attempt to convince you that advertising has broken its social contract irretrievably and is now the single greatest source of friction in our daily lives. Next, I'm going to explain how an earned marketing approach will fill the gap that's left by advertising's impending demise. And then I'm going to show examples. This is a creative showcase, after all, of what I mean by earned marketing and juxtapose it with how it would look differently if it was done like advertising. All right, so let's jump into it. Part one, the failure of advertising. I like to start by regrounding us in what I call the holy trinity of media and marketing, which is you've got the media, you've got the marketers, and you've got the masses. And for pretty much all of the history of business, this has been largely unchanged. The media have held all the cards. They've been the dominant force because they were able to reach the masses. The marketers, of course, gave them the investment. Media would seduce people with sports, news, and entertainment, and then interrupt them periodically to advertise to them. For decades, this was largely unchanged. In fact, at one point, even through the 90s, Marketers would wine and dine the media just trying to get the most coveted ad placements for their brands because the media really held all the cards. In that world, the media would never over advertise because they couldn't lose the, the masses and they'd have nothing to sell the advertisers, right? And then along came Google, which of course we all love and use every single day for just about everything. But Google's actual mission is to make all the content in the world available for free. And that doesn't bode well for companies that exist purely to charge for content. Right? And so, of course, as Google became dominant in every way of life, uh, the media all fell in line. And so they all offered their content for free starting around the first decade of the 21st century. Now, let's remember, Google exists to make money off advertising. right? So as news consum consumption shifted online, the revenues at media outlets got totally devastated. But that's not just a Google story. It's also a story about the impact Google had in Silicon Valley. Because for 20 years, every startup that's come out of Silicon Valley has raised money almost entirely on the premise that they could create a better mousetrap than the media, and they could use those eyeballs to monetize their technology through advertising. Okay. Of course, Facebook became the ultimate winner in this competition. But it wasn't just Silicon Valley. We're in an era now where every industry has taken their cues from Silicon Valley, and every industry is now trying to turn every available real estate into advertising space. This is a TSA bin where our border patrol is watching for terrorists. You can place your ad here. This is a hospital where people are grieving, waiting for life-changing news. You can place your ad here. Now, if anybody in the audience sells these ads, shame on you. This seat cost $1,000, and yet it's cluttered up by more than 50 advertisements in the view. Everything from Coca-Cola to waste management. Do you think we admire your brand now? What's happened is not only has the over-advertising of everything led to people hating advertising, it has decimated 
the media industry. It has atomized marketing budgets such that the media industry is now on the ropes and in many cases being taken over by billionaires. So our holy trinity shifted, right? Marketers now hold all the cards, they have the budgets, the media are on the ropes. The masses are not yet willing to pay for content. If only we'd use that power more wisely. Instead, marketers pushed the boundaries everywhere. Ads became increasingly intrusive, irritating, constantly interrupting people. By some measures, people are now exposed to more than 5,000 commercial messages a day. In other words, advertising has now become the single greatest cause of friction in our daily lives. And does anybody believe that Cambridge Analytica really only applied to politics? Every major advertiser in the world does the exact same thing, trying to sell us more stuff. So it's led to this tug of war, right? Consumers deploying ad blockers and DVR, media propers fighting to have them disabled, and then outright anger. That big spike over there is people just saying they're angry at advertising. There's even companies now, this is Ev Williams' new company, Scroll. Companies now that exist solely to let you support journalism while not being exposed to advertising, right? We're trying to fight the dark forces of advertising that are destroying our minds and democracy, says the founder of Twitter and Medium. But ultimately, this was always gonna be a losing battle for both the media and marketers because Netflix, Spotify, the spat of streaming services have come along and convinced the masses to pay for content again, right? Newspaper subscriptions are back up. People are paying for, for movies, music, news, things that we thought they would never pay for again means that they've taken back control. Consumers are now at the top of our holy trinity. Media outlets are also taking note. They're deprioritizing advertising in their revenue. They're deprioritizing their advertisers, instead trying to offer a better experience to their audiences. So to summarize, Google and Facebook decimated the media industry, giving control to marketers. Marketers totally blew it, ruining everybody's experiences with over-advertising. Now, consumers have taken over control. Media and marketing are being consumerized on their terms. Meanwhile, Tim Cook and the US Senate are trying to ruin Facebook, and we all just keep pretending that Google only exists to make the world a better place. So part two, the framework for earned marketing. So whether or not you agree with how far the trends I'm describing are gonna go, most people do in fact agree they're happening. And this is where the usual old tropes come up, like the things that help advertising executives sleep at night. My two favorites being, people don't dislike advertising, they only like, dislike bad advertising, right? Or, advertising will stay the same, only the channels will change. I disagree wholeheartedly and believe the advertising industrial complex needs systemic disruption and change. I talk about this through the lens of earning consumers engagement. So let's take a look at this framework for earned marketing. First and foremost, um, despite what Martin Sorrell would have you believe, advertising does not equal marketing. And marketing is booming. Never before has there been more investment in marketing. Never before have consumers been more aware of or engaged in marketing than they are today. However, they're demanding a new relationship with marketers and they're rewarding marketers for different behaviors and either boycotting or simply turning their backs on those that are stuck in the past. So what do they want? This is gonna sound really simple, guys. Listen to them and engage them personally. They expect you to be culturally relevant. They expect you to do more than just sell products. Of course, that's a nod to brand purpose and ESG, as well as though creating lifestyle brands and a great experience besides just selling the product. And then ultimately, when you're gonna sell them something, they expect you to substantiate your claims with evidence because they don't believe you. So of course, this is where he says, that sounds really simple. My ad agency already does all that stuff. And so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna start with a simple premise that no, they don't. So let's look at a couple distinctions that differentiate what I'm talking about from how advertising is done. The first of which is the distinction between a concept and an idea because advertising agencies in particular are built to create concepts because a concept is something that you can make an ad about. And in fact, if you don't make an ad about a concept, it doesn't exist, right? It doesn't just live in the world unless you make an ad about it. An idea is something you can do 
and it lives in the world and maybe people talk about it even if you don't buy ads. So this is a great example of what happens when you lock on a concept instead of an idea. This is from the Super Bowl earlier this year. Jeep landed at the concept that we should talk about everybody meeting in the middle. Then they made an ad about it where Bruce Springsteen drives his Jeep to a chapel in the middle of the country and recites a bunch of words about meeting in the middle. Now, as this astute commenter noticed, the chapel is actually locked for visitors. And if they hadn't made the ad, nothing would happen, right? It's just a concept. So I look at this as a massive missed opportunity. If Jeep had just used their real budget to do something really meaningful, think about what could have happened instead of an ad that ultimately was pulled from YouTube three days after it ran on the Super Bowl with jeers coming in from all possible sides of the political spectrum. All right, key distinction number two, it kind of builds on the first. It's the idea of activating versus advertising. The difference with an ad is that you're just saying something, whereas with an activation, you're doing something. The Fansville campaign has been one of the biggest budget ad campaigns on the airwaves today. Tens of millions have been spent on the talent, the production, the placements. If you read their Can Lions submissions, you believe that it led to a tidal wave of social media conversation about their ad campaign. Again, no, it didn't. People don't go on the internet to talk about your ad campaign. By contrast, for years, Dr. Pepper's also held the halftime challenges, right? Where at every halftime, they have college students come on, they try and throw footballs into a giant can of Dr. Pepper, and whoever wins gets free tuition and scholarship, uh, you know, free uh, scholarship to college. These activations do generate a tidal wave of social media conversation. And look at the difference in the emojis and the positivity. Right, people high-fiving and celebrating versus rolling their eyes in a poop emoji for the Fansville campaign. So this is the difference between doing versus saying. Imagine if Dr. Pepper had just committed to the activation and then partnered with the media outlets to tailor it for their audiences. Key distinction three, credentialing versus extending. This is about how you work with third parties. In most advertising contexts, we come up with the idea in our conference room then we bring in third parties like influencers, we pay them a bunch of money, we have them go and extend our campaign. Right? What I'm saying here is, in the modern world where we've broken all trust in the Holy Trinity, we have no credibility in anything. Anything we want to say as a marketing claim has to be credentialed by a third party. That can be key opinion leaders, that can be influencers, third party, NGOs, nonprofits, whoever you want. It can be a brand partner. And then the fourth, amplifying versus upfront media planning. Now, I want to be clear here when I say upfront media planning, this is not just about television upfronts. Most of us acknowledge that those are going to die soon. This is about when media planning comes into your strategy. What role does media planning play in your strategy? Because in most of the advertising industrial complex, you wonder why that revenue was going up while the headcount is going down. It's because they've convinced everybody that media planning is a strategic initiative and that software should do it for us. Okay, the truth is in an earned marketing con uh, uh, environment, you start with the idea, you partner with people, you engage, and at the very end, you use your paid media budget to amplify. It should actually be the very last thing you do. In fact, you start the whole process pretending you have no paid media at all. Come up with the idea, what would you do? Who would you get to share this idea? Who would you get to talk about it? Then at the very end, you're like, oh, look at this, I got a whole bunch of paid media money, and you amplify it. So, leaning into the earned marketing framework, this is the framework from the book. For those of you who are soccer fans, you'll appreciate the reference. Um, I talk about advertising like kicking it with your big toe, and earned marketing like using your laces, which is listen continuously, activate, don't advertise, collaborate as a strategy, engage instead of targeting, and scale as the very last thing that you do. All right, here we are, part three, the creative showcase of the creative showcase. So hopefully by now I've convinced you advertising is the single greatest cause of friction in our daily lives. Consumers are in charge and they're demanding a new relationship with marketers. And that what I'm talking about is actually distinct and different from advertising. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Many of you probably saw this, um, advertising's favorite failure, Kendall Jenner, 
um, worked with Proactive because she had been roasted on the red carpet for having acne. And so Proactive thought they would use an old school approach with a new school influencer and you know, tell everybody that Jenner had cured her acne using Proactive. Um, of course, not even her own mother believed that that had happened. And when I say that every major media outlet and half the internet clapped back at this, it's not an exaggeration. Right? So our task was to bring some credibility to this partnership, because the brand still had two years left on this deal. So how are we gonna bring credibility to this partnership? Let's take a look at a video. Hey guys, it's Kendall Jenner, and I am here with Proactive and Team Vogue to talk about skin positivity. So what did we just see? So what we did, obviously, we listened, we activated, we collaborated, we engaged, we scaled. You see the theme there. Um, what it was is skin positivity is a trending societal conversation. It was something that was relevant to the brand and to Jenner's personal experience. So we said, let's bring her in. We're going to actually listen to all the mean things people have said about Kendall Jenner's skin online. We're going to paint them onto this building in Brooklyn work with a famous artist, that's the collaboration. She comes in and sketches a mural over the top of it, inviting consumers, paint by numbers. They paint the whole thing, and when it's done, it's this beautiful mural. We've painted positivity over the negativity, and we host a series of conversations about the impact of acne on self-esteem, self-worth, et cetera. So all told, Teen Vogue was a partner through the whole thing. They literally at the table collaborating through the whole thing. They were not just somebody we bought ads from at the end. And we received more than 2 million positive social media conversations and engagements around this program. Got Jenner back on board, got the brand back on board, added credibility to the whole thing. All right, so now let's look at an example where we took an earned marketing approach from the very beginning. And this is with Aspirin, Bayer Aspirin. And the video does a great job of telling the whole story. So I'm just gonna go ahead and roll tape. Stewart is a heart attack survivor, and um, you and your wife wrote a song to honor him. Can you tell us about yeah. that? Yeah, we wrote a song called Second Chance, celebrating Stewart's second chance. So how does that differ from advertising? Well, I can actually tell you because there was an advertising concept also on the table, right? It was going to be 360, omni-channel, all the buzzwords, right? but it was a concept. The concept was listen to the rhythm of your heart, we'll make an ad about that concept. Instead, what we did was we partnered, we collaborated with Leslie Adam Jr. and his wife. We did something, we activated, we produced an original song that was extended, it was worth talking about. That's an idea worth talking about, right? The song was set to the actual rhythm of his, his father-in-law's heartbeat. 
right? That's an idea worth talking about. So again, it's, we listened, we activated, we collaborated, we engaged, and then we scaled it with paid media, of course, at the end. All right, this is my personal favorite. Um, it's from Usenex, which is a brand that has no right to be on TikTok. Um, but they wanted to be, and they wanted to use a new product launch to be relevant to a younger de demographic. Um, you know, enter their big global ad agency to get the first crack at this. Um, it was the too sick to be sick challenge. Get it? Like they're sick, like they're cool. Too sick to be sick. You see what, you see what they did there? Yeah. So um, the first attempted campaign, I, I call it the marketing equivalent of a disconnected dad dabbing on the internet. Um, it's because the actual system in large agencies is designed from the top down and because they're based around concepts that you can force people to watch the ads about. Um, so therefore we end up with, I'm going to actually read this. The ad says, it's Halloween and the only thing scarier than your costume is getting a cold. Show us how you can transform from too sick for trick or treat to so sick and ready to party. But remember, if you're really sick, take Mucinex. Might as well have the hashtag dabbing dad right there in the description. All right, so didn't actually play over very well on, on TikTok, despite them buying a billion views for it. Um, and so they asked us to come in and say, how would we do this differently? So remember, collaborating as a strategy is central to the, the process here from an earned marketing approach. So we take over the campaign. You can see the microsite still looks very, very similar. Um, instead of creating the concept in our own conference room and then extending it through others, though, we actually partnered with a creator, um, a couple you know, who are, are natural native creators to TikTok themselves. Um, and so let's take a look at how it went down. To launch Musinex Night Shift, we brought the brand to TikTok. We were the first OTC brand to ever launch on the platform. To ensure we succeeded, we partnered with TikTok pioneers Allison and Twitch. So what we do for you, Mr. Mucus. And with their help, created a unique dance challenge that not only captured our product message. Take a little bit of Mucinex and then boogie on right before you go to sleep. But was designed to be shared as virally as the flu. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Twitch. And I'm Allison, and we want you to copy our moves and beat the zombie funk. Post a video of yourself doing this routine for the chance to win $1,000 or a VIP experience. Oh. Oh, there he is. Come on in here. Night Shift obtained 2.8% of cold and flu market share. No other launch exceeded 1%. It achieved a 10% market share in nighttime, outperforming VIX by 118 BPS. And the numbers speak for themselves. Over 1 million videos uploaded with more than 5.7 billion combined views. Not only was this the most successful Mucinex product launch in company history, we were the number one most engaged brand in TikTok history. Which, you know, isn't too bad for a sentient ball of mucus. All right. So you're getting the theme there? We listened, we activated, we collaborated, we engaged, and finally we scaled it with paid media. If we had tried to come up with all of that in our own conference room, it just wouldn't have been as good. Right? We had to collaborate with a creator uh, couple that was native to the the platform. There are a lot of aspects there in terms of the activation, the engagement around it, you know, competing for the prizes, all those things. Um, you got a diverse cast. And then of course at the end, we had a direct buy with TikTok to amplify and reach more people. All right. So we wind that all back. Advertising is like kicking it with your big toe, right? Earned marketing is like using your laces. Listen continuously, activate instead of advertising, collaborate as a strategy engage instead of targeting, and then scale it as the very last thing you do. So with that, I'm Paul Dyer from Libby Taylor. Thank you all very much for listening. And, okay.